We have established that a starch-based diet it should be recommended to the public for ideal health. I'm really wondering though, um, does this apply to all life stages? Would you recommend, like, say, for instance, children or the elderly population? Well, children are designed to live on human breast milk. So their diet is 50% fat. <clears throat> By design, this is a special time in a mammal's life uh, when they're exclusively bread fed, breastfed for the first six months of life. And then at six months, children develop teeth, no coincidence. And they also develop uh, the coordination to reach out and grasp whatever mother has in her hand. And at that time, whatever ma mother has in her hand, the child will grasp. Meat would be pretty hard for a young child to swallow. But they would do just fine on cooked, cooked food. The human diet is cooked food, like cooked potatoes, cooked mashed corn, breads. Uh, these are natural things for kids to eat. Now, kids don't eat many vegetables, green and yellow vegetables, because they're kind of a bitter taste. Uh, they're not very calorie giving. So if you're starting to think of vegetable foods in terms of kale and broccoli and cauliflower, you're not going to win much favor with your children. They will go for fruits. Fruits are sweet tasting. So you should be feeding children uh, starches and fruits and maybe a little vegetable matter after six months of age. And yes, elderly, definitely elderly, uh, should be eating this kind of diet. I just read an article about the oldest man in the world. He's a Brazilian, whether it's true or not. He's said to be 126 years old. And one of the comments he made in the article is he never misses his beans and rice. You know, yeah, old people need to eat this way too. I mean, people eat this way because this is people's diets. It's just like horses have a diet and uh, uh, tigers have a diet. And, uh, you know, every, every animal has a diet. And this diet is pretty much established after the weaning period in mammals. And it always continues. Well, whales have diets. You know, they just, they, you don't, because you get to be in your last part of your life cycle in any mammal, you don't switch to another mammal's kind of food. Elephants don't switch to meat. You know, cats don't switch to grass uh, just because they get older. So the human diet is a starch-based diet with fruits and vegetables and uh, a little meat. I don't know. Uh, I don't recommend a little meat. Would a little meat make things better in the human diet? I think that's up for debate, uh, but I don't recommend it because my patients can't eat a little meat. I see no reason why a little meat or a little dairy would enhance the diet other than it's just a, a nugget of calories, and sometimes people need more calories. The meat and dairy today are quite risky compared to what they used to be. They're highly infected with various kinds of cancer-causing viruses, leukemia viruses, uh, loaded with uh, other kinds of microbes as well as uh, just filthy dirty with people poisoning environmental chemicals. So, you know, when somebody says, well, how about a little uh, dairy for my, my baby? <clears throat> well, that dairy is likely infected with bovine leukemia virus. I mean, how many bovine leukemia viruses do you need to give a child? It doesn't sound like any. Uh, likewise, your fish is so loaded with methylmercury, just a few pieces of fish is declared a health hazard by the FDA and the EPA. So, I mean, how much poisonous methylmercury do you feed to your kids? Uh, it is a, because of this, because there is so much contamination and so little obvious need for these animal foods and people's natural behavior mostly, that I just say don't go there. Uh, you know, just plain and simple don't cross that line. It's much easier for you if you say, you know, I'm not going to smoke or I'm going to smoke. I'm not going to drink that bottle of whiskey or I'm going to drink that bottle of whiskey. I'm not going to eat meat, dairy, and eggs. I'm going to eat rice, corn, and potatoes. It's just easier for people's behaviors. That's why I teach it, and uh, that's how people learn it. Unfortunately, it has to be an all-or-nothing thing for these food addicts, us food addicts. Uh, it's just too hard to take a little bit. Yeah, most people from my experience can't handle just a little bit because all this food is so stimulating it it really makes you want to eat more so I think the all or none approach in this case works so much better. I could get back into pepperoni pizza so fast. <laughs> you know, it's just, pepperoni pizza was probably the last thing that I was able to uh, right. stop 
because it was so, just like you say, so stimulating. Uh, the salt and the spices and probably the grease, uh, you know, it was, and the carbohydrate and the pizza crust and the, you know, the sugar and all the stuff. It was, uh, I'm, I'm sure if I thought about it for a little bit, I would salivate even more for pepperoni pizza all these days. Yeah, they build the food to make it hard to resist. Just like heroin's hard to resist once you get into it. Uh, you just have to say no if you want your health back. This is, as uh, you've probably heard me say if you've been watching my work lately, as I get older, I get simpler in my thinking. Maybe it's loss of brain cells. I don't know. Or I think as people get older, things become clearer. And uh, I've been discussing lately about all I've been talking about is food poisoning. Yeah. Uh, plain and simple, we're suffering from food poisoning. It's just like if you uh, consumed lead, uh, you'd get lead poisoning. And if you consumed uh, listeria, you'd get a foodborne illness, food poisoning from this bacteria. Uh, we're suffering from food poisoning that's of far, far greater importance to the individual, to the nation, to the world than any lead poisoning or listeria poisoning. The food poisoning problem we're talking about from animal foods and oils, primarily vegetable oils, that kind of food poisoning has done more devastation to individuals, uh, to their families, to the economy of their families, uh, you know, husbands, wives, children, and so on in terms of constipation, obesity, greasy skin, heart attacks, breast cancer, colon cancer. I mean, it's just devastated. You don't, you don't know a person, not one of your listeners, um, is limited enough in their life that they don't know a person with probably every single disease I mentioned. So these are uh, epidemic diseases in individuals, families, communities, communities. Uh, the financial cost is huge. I mean, just look around the corner. You have a medical center, a cancer center, a heart hospital, and so on. You can see what the economical consequences are. Our hospital buildings are better than the casinos in Las Vegas because they make more money and by a, a similar method by basically cheating the public. Yes, they do some good. Yes, in, uh, casinos are inter entertaining. But by and large, you go there and lose. And when you go to a hospital with chronic diseases, you go and lose. And they don't give you what you want. You go to a casino, you want the money. You don't get it. You go to a hospital, you want your health. You do not get it. But, you know, I mean, these are major, major billion-dollar uh, businesses. And then you look at uh, our country and trying to pay for the health care of an entire nation. It's, uh, it's on the verge of bankruptcy. Uh, the Affordable Care Act has uh, gone a long way to at least opening some possibilities. But, you know, we have a huge problem. And these economic problems, they put us in, a, in an unfavorable position in terms of international um, finances. Uh, we borrow our money from uh, China to pay for our health care system. The health care system, the health industry is the only segment of our economy that's growing in the United States. And the reason it's growing is because we can borrow the money from China to pay for all of this sickness and, quote, care for this uh, dietary disease, these food poisoning illnesses. And then the last thing in terms of harm is our military. I mean, it's probably, no, that's not the last thing, but let's go on to the next to the last thing, the military. And the military, uh, they're disadvantaged. Uh, they're fighting all over the world, our military, and we've got... Uh, overweight, sickly young men and women trying to defend the United States. And half the people in the military are overweight. And they're thinking about their constipated bowels and their indigestion and their arthritic pains rather than focusing on the job they have to do. So it impairs us uh, militarily, uh, this diet does, and puts it at the United States at great risk. And then the last thing, and, and probably the most important thing, at least from my viewpoint, my viewpoint these days, is the uh, costs on the environment of food. You probably heard that uh, livestock, meat, dairy, eggs, fish, you know, chicken, etc. Livestock is connected to, causally connected to, over half the greenhouse gas production in the world. So it's devastating to our atmosphere. It's uh, number one or two polluter of the environment results in the, it's the greatest cost of deforestation on the planet is uh, opening up the uh, forest to graze cattle 
And you compare these environmental costs to, say, the environmental costs of growing tobacco. Nothing. I mean, you know, tobacco production will actually decrease greenhouse gases. Poppy for heroin. Uh, potatoes or rye for alcohol. Excuse me. The environmental impact of these other devastating habits, and they are. I'm not trying to minimize them. I'm just trying to put them in comparison to food. Uh, they don't even compare. Uh, food is so far ahead at its destruction all the way from the child to the entire planet, it isn't even in the same category as alcohol, heroin, tobacco, etc. You name the bad habit. Food is so far ahead in terms of its destruction, devastation, and what needs to be fixed.